had no idea what was going to happen when I started, you know, this organization out of my basement while I was a single mom raising my two daughters and running my private practice. I didn't know. I, I had no idea what, what was going to um, lie ahead in terms of the opportunities. Certainly had no thought about um, accolades or awards or recognition. And in fact, when I was notified about um, uh, first about the, uh, the be, being named, you know, social entrepreneur by the Manhattan Institute, you know, and I, I thought that was so cool. I didn't even know what a social entrepreneur was. <laughs> but I, was like, I just wow, learned. That, if, that's, if that's what I am, I love that. And then the day I got the, the email, and it came in an email, which was a very odd experience in 2012 from Time Magazine. I thought it was, I thought it wasn't, I thought it was like somebody was like, you know, pulling my leg like it was a joke. And um, I remember um, I had remarried by this time, so it was 2012. I had these two wonderful daughters, and it was a Sunday morning. My husband was at a conference, and I was just you know, getting up like we all do and, and you know, got the, the, this notice from Time Magazine. You know, you've been selected as one of the 2012 most influential people in the world for your work with Game an Hour. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I just And my daughters, you know, both who were sleeping, they're like, Mom – what are you doing? What's going on? And I called my husband. It still makes me teary. And I said, honey, this just happened. He was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is going to change everything. And I said, yes, because now I'll be able to reach more people. I'll be able to do more. And, and that is what it has helped me to do. And so I'm so grateful for time to recognize this was during the height of the war effort and that they chose the work of Given Hour to recognize it allowed us to reach even more veterans, service members, their families. Um, and and that's, that's the thing, isn't it? When you do, when you do good and you, you put your heart and soul into something, amazing things happen. You don't even have to look for them to happen. It just, it just sort of pulls you through and, and opens doors and you meet amazing people like I met you and together, you then do more good stuff together. No, that's true. Again, congratulations and thank you for that. And you know, it's, it's interesting some of the analogies you make in terms of doors opening and you, you pull yourself through. Um, you know, those are great analogies in terms of getting through life. Obviously led to the naming of our show for Next Steps Forward. And you know, it is just one step at a time. For me, it was one step at a time home from the Twin Towers on 9-11, um, you know, having been at ground zero that day. So, um, you know, congrats again. That's terrific work. So we really, truly appreciate that. Um, you know, in terms of Given Hour, which is sort of the, the precursor to your, your current role, um, mm -hmm. maybe you could share with some of your listeners in terms of the, the breadth and scope and the size that you grew that to from sort of a, a concept and idea to just this powerful enterprise, for lack of a better word. So it really was, you know, this, 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 this I don't even know how to explain it. People have asked and, and I didn't understand really what I was capable of. I don't know if any of us really understand what we are truly capable of until we're tested or until we're given the opportunity and we somehow, we think about it as, you know, you either you can think about rising to the occasion or stretching way out of your comfort zone, whatever that, that is that, that fit for you, you know, to think about, I think that's something that we can all relate to. You know, we find ourselves in a situation or in circumstances and we look back and go, wow, I didn't know I could do that. So I had no idea um, that I was capable of building an organization of, I, I was a psychologist, which is, is in and of itself something I'm incredibly proud of, sure. the training and the years of education, all of that. But that stuff I knew, that was sort of like, that's in my DNA, understanding people. And, and I honed those skills and all that. But building an organization, becoming a CEO, I had no idea. I literally, when I had that, that epiphany about, you know, I got to do something about these men and women who are going to be coming home and they're going to be hurting and we need to get mental health folks organized. I had no idea how to do that. So I literally 
drove to Barnes and Noble. <laughs> I was in my my mom van. I let the girls like look at books and you know run around the stacks, and I sat on the floor and I read nonprofits for dummies. That was the beginning of building what became a national nonprofit organization. That by the time I stepped away to take the position I'm currently in, had given over 300,000 hours of free care provided by mental health professionals all over the nation, giving an hour a week of their time just because someone who had served our nation or was currently serving or loved someone who was serving just because that individual was in need. And, and I had no idea. I just started where, you know, basically that first step took the next and the next, and I kept, you know, I called people and somebody would give me another lead and somebody else and so on and so forth. And I got the first grant, you know, that I got was a small grant because we weren't, we didn't even really exist as an organization. We barely were official as an organization. And I got a small grant and I, I didn't, I didn't hire me, you know, I didn't pay for me because I, I could still support my, myself and my daughters through my practice because I hadn't walked away yet from my practice, but I hired the most important person in any organization, the admin support. <laughs> so I, I, I hired somebody and it just, you know, it snowballed. It just continued to grow and evolve. And, and I think for me, and again, I think this is, I see this with you, Chris, I see it in every project you take on. I, I think I intuitively led the way I believe is, is healthy and, and supportive. I would meet with groups, meet with individuals, and I would ask them, how can we be of help to you? What can I do to be of help to your mission? How can we partner? And it just led to a lot of great, efforts, opportunities. Also, a lot of things, you know, didn't turn out or didn't materialize, but that's just the building, isn't it? You just, that's what you do. But that, that offer um, really allowed us to build the organization into not only a national effort, but then we went international and began to um, build partnerships with uh, the UK's Ministry of Defense mm -hmm. um, and, and work with our friends in Canada and had conversations we're building in other countries when then I, I stepped away to take this position. But given our continues to go and grow strong in serving our service members, our veterans, and given our expanded many years ago, always opening up uh, the network uh, to provide free mental health care to individuals who had been affected by natural disasters, by man-made traumas like mass shootings, um, I'm very, very proud of the work that Given Hour um, has done for the last now 16 years. No, oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And again, congratulations. And, you know, hearing that story, you know, and, and talking about the work that we've been doing over the last year, you know, it, it's a great testimony, I guess, to the American spirit and the will, where something as simple as, a, you know, a cocktail napkin idea, uh, if it's something you're passionate about, go for it, run with it, um, and, and see where it can go. You know, folks don't know about my nonprofit background, but, you know, started a little thing in Connecticut 11 years ago, shipping uh, care packages to deployed troops. And now I'm working with the White House in terms of helping veterans end, you know, end veteran suicide. And so just simple ideas, getting, you know, you mentioned the word partnership partner, uh, Barbara. You know, in today's world, we need to collaborate, we need to partner, we need to work more than ever together before. Um, and that's how we're going to accomplish greater and greater things. And so, I uh, appreciate the work that you've done there, uh, the work that Given Hour has done and continues to do um, globally on that sense. Um, you know, we're going to be coming up on a break here shortly. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be talking with Dr. Barbara Van Dalen about her current role uh, working with the White House. Uh, we'll talk about um, COVID-19 and, and today's mental health state and how that's going to affect people, how it is affecting folks and how we go forward. And, um, you know, we were open for phone calls. So come on, give us a call if you have any questions for myself or Dr. Barbara Van Dalen. So maybe we can, you know, we've got a little bit more of, of your, your background and the history of, of how you uh, have taken your steps forward in life uh, to get you to, to the White House today. Um, you know, I, I touched on the executive order signed last March, um, the task force being stood up uh, last summer. That's when you and I got, the, got to meet. So I, again, appreciate that. 
Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with the task force and what was recently rolled out and what will be coming up in the future. Absolutely. So, you know, I was, um, I was doing the work, uh, my life's work. I was running Given Hour last summer. It was last, it was last May. The executive order, as you mentioned, had been released um, in March. The president signed the executive order. And I was actually interviewed by a media um, outlet, you know, um, major network, had contacted me because, I, you know, this, I was one of the leaders of the veteran um, organization in this space, you know, different veterans organizations. So it was pretty typical that I'd get a call from XYZ saying, hey, what do you think about? And so I got this call, hey, can we come interview you about this executive order? And so I was like, yeah, sure. And so I read the executive order. And that was, you know, again, back in March of last year. And I said, wow, you know, this, this is extraordinary. If the administration, you know, basically if the administration pulls this off, <laughs> if they can actually do this, this is extraordinary. And the reason why I thought it was such a, a huge um, step forward for mental health in general, um, for our nation and not just for veterans, is that that there had never been an, an elevation um, of a mental health challenge from the federal government, you know, basically saying this is an all of nation um, effort. And so I, you know, I, I was really impressed. And then I didn't think anything else of it. Went about my work for, you know, the next couple of months and we got a call in um, uh, May asking whether I would consider being the executive director. And I was, you know, honored to be asked. And, of course, had to do some very serious thinking about, you know, leaving the organization that I founded and ran. And so had very uh, supportive board and, and was able to hand the organization off um, to a really amazing leader in and, own, in and of his own right, who happens to also be my husband, who was had just stepped away from a senior executive position at the American Psychological Association. So... It all worked out. It was like the universe was lining everything up uh, so that I could take this position. So I went in to meet with the folks at the White House, and I said, okay, I'm honored, but i got to tell you what I think. Uh, in order for us to address veteran suicide, we have to take on suicide as a nation. We can't, we can't assume that we can just you know, build something that basically says, any veteran who maybe is dealing with suicidal impulses or ideation thoughts, come on in, we'll, we'll help you. You know, I mean, that would be nice, but the, one of the main reasons why, whether it's a veteran or a civilian or a service member, why it's so hard for people to get help when they are feeling that desperate and that overwhelmed is because our country, we humans, just don't do a very good job when it comes to talking about mental health in general, definitely not suicide. So I, you know, sort of presented that. And the other, the other piece of this is for the prior 15 years, I had been part of a collective effort working with a lot of other organizations to really change the narrative about our veterans who come home from service and return to our communities. For too long, people, you know, and some of this was accidental or unintentional, but, you know, sometimes movies portray veterans as, you know, they are broken or they're damaged or they, you know, uh, just, you know, are not, it's not accurate. Most, most men and women who serve our nation come home and continue to be leaders in their own communities. They continue to take care of their families. They continue to build businesses. They're like my dad, even if they are struggling with something that affected them, they still have all the qualities and skills that make them incredible assets. So we don't want to do anything ever that focuses some, you know, sort of a negative narrative. So suicide is a huge national challenge. Our nation has seen an increase in suicide in the last 25 years, over 33% increase in suicide in general. And there are certain groups who are at higher risk, our veterans, absolutely, because of the experiences they have defending our nation. But they're not the only 
high-risk group. There are other populations, other groups within our nation. And so prevent, while well, yes, we are, are focusing, working very closely with the Department of Veterans Affairs, they're the co-chair of the task force, we are working with all of the agencies. This is an interagency effort. And yes, we are focusing on, on building programs specifically to reach our veterans and military families and communities all over the country. But the, this is the first ever public health approach focused on all Americans. We must educate our nation, our citizens, about mental health generally, about suicide in, in specific. And so this effort, the task force that grew out of the executive order, prevents is unique in that it is massive. It is all of government, all of nation. It is aspirational. We can prevent suicide. And it's public health, meaning it's focused on everyone. So you can hear it probably could have been several efforts, um, several separate efforts, but lucky us, we get to weave them all together into one big, huge project. The first year was focused on building the roadmap which was released, and Chris, you were with us at the White House on June 17th, which was a, a, a wonderful day. So the roadmap was released, and now for the next two years, we're focused on implementing all the recommendations and launching, which we just did, the public health um, uh, campaign that we'll, I know we're going to talk a little bit about, called REACH. We launched that July 7th, and so the next two years will be on pushing, promoting, educating, um, and implementing all the recommendations. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And I know that the work that the task force has been focused on was really initially stood up to focus specifically on the veteran suicide issue. Uh, but to your point, you mentioned how this really is an all-encompassing mental health national campaign. And I think for the rest of our conversation, you know, I th these pieces are going to intertwine a lot. There's going to be a lot of intersection here. Um, you know, you talked about your father when he came back and, you know, back then, you know, there was shell shock. Nobody talked about it. It was just like, oh, well, you just saw a lot of mortar action and, and that was it. So, uh, you know, you're seeing more and more of, of those remaining from the World War II generation in Korea. They didn't talk about it before, but now they're finally starting to, to open up and, and share some of the things that they, they saw and just didn't want to talk about for the last 40, 50, 60 years. Um, you know, you talk about changing the narrative about veterans coming back as broken. Um, you know, that leads into the conversation in terms of just anybody who has any type of uh, a mental health conflict. I don't want to say issue, but, you know, a conflict um, with themselves. You know, people don't want to admit that there's something, there might be something wrong or they might be having trouble or, or struggling with something, you know, and, and you always hear about the word stigma. And that's something that's led to suicide ideation, not only in veterans, but in, in anybody in a mental health um, situation. And so, you know, as we become more unified in terms of our mental health campaigns, more unified in our mental health strategies, you know, what can we do um, as just good citizens? You know, if we see somebody who's struggling, see somebody who might not be acting the way they normally do, you know, what can we do to let them know we're here, um, you know, to use your word, we're, we're reaching out, you know, reach out to me for some help. What are some things that we can, can think about going forward? Well, that's a great, that's a great, um commentary, Chris, and, and you're right. You know, it, it, it's really important for all of us to acknowledge, to recognize, acknowledge, and to share when we can that we humans struggle. We all struggle. Some of us struggle more because of a variety of things. It may be that we have experienced um, very either painful or traumatic um, events, circumstances. And maybe some of those circumstances, events, traumas happened to us when we were young and we still carry the pain, um, the, the shame, sadly, of what happened to us. Sometimes we think about our service members, we think about the men and women who served during the Iraq and Afghanistan era, and many who are still serving in those nations that where, where there is still conflict and still danger. Um, every day we have men and women in harm's way. And we think about what they experience, what they witness, what they participated in, in ser as part of, of service to their country. And all of us should be able to relate to these things affect us. 
And and then so you have the those are the things that that are external that can affect us. There's also internal contributing factors that affect us. Some of us have risk factors for a variety of things. I myself have uh, I'm at risk for heart disease. Why you know it's genetic. My dad died of heart disease um, when he was 62 years old. My brothers, both of my brothers, have already developed heart disease and have both either one had a heart attack, the other was was an impending heart attack, but it was caught before it happened. So I know I'm at risk. That's genetic. That's just, you know, so I do things to take care of myself. I eat well. I exercise. I try to, you know, deal with stress in ways that are healthy. We also have risk factors for suicide. If somebody is genetically predisposed to depression, that isn't something that they ask for. It is part of their genetic makeup. It is like my mother who developed a psychotic um, episode when she was in her early 30s. She didn't do anything. She didn't bring that on herself. It happened because of a combination of factors. So we have risk factors because of things that happen to us. We have risk factors because of things that are inside of us that may emerge. That doesn't mean that suicide or suicidal ideation or severe mental health issues or mental illness are inevitable, but we do need to to kind of get over ourselves and thinking that, oh, it's them, that's not me, or it's that family, not my family. Because I would guess that anyone listening, anyone listening to this now or in the future, If you really ask yourself, have I been touched by mental health challenges, either me, myself, or someone I care care about, the answer is yes, yes. And so the first thing we all need to do, because then that allows us to be much more open um, to others, is recognizing that, that this is part of the human condition. So that by recognizing in ourselves, by being open those conversations by being willing to reach to someone who might be hurting, who might be struggling, and really important, willing to share, willing to say, you know what, me too, you know, I struggled, or you know what, my brother, my sister, my father, my mother went through X, Y, and Z, and this was really helpful to them. Can you imagine? That's like a lifeline that you offer to someone else who may be in pain. So, Recognizing in ourselves and being willing to share with someone um, is so powerful and something that we can all do. No, that's great. Thank you for that. And that's um, very powerful in terms of recognizing and sharing. And, you know, you use the word reach, which I know is more and more in your vernacular as that campaign gets rolled out further. Um, You know, there have been a lot of mental health treatments over the years, you know, we've talked, talked briefly about the veteran space, you know, from World War II to Korea to Vietnam to post 9-11. And we talked about shell shock in World War II, um, you know, sort of the, the lost generation, which unfortunately, you know, they were treated poorly then and now are, you know, in terms of Vietnam era, are now getting older in their age. We've lost more veterans to suicide than whose names are on the Vietnam Wall War Memorial in Washington, D.C. And that's Correct. something that we know has to stop. And folks like yourself are coming up with ideas, with policy recommendations. And the great news is the work that you're doing, yes, again, while well, initially targeted towards the veteran space and even active, active duty now, because we're hearing more and more about that. Um, and certainly now in today's COVID-19 world, first responders, the frontline folks in the hospitals, um, all of that, you know, it's, it's more and more. And so your REACH campaign couldn't come at a better time. Um, you know, obviously it wasn't planned to be that way. But in terms of the rollout, um, this is just spectacular for us as a nation and us as a society to tackle these issues, to tackle these problems head on, and not just as an agency here or a nonprofit there, but to your point earlier, as a nation, we are tackling this head on. So thank you for that work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, it's, thank you, Chris. And, and I was just talking about this earlier today. I was at, at a meeting at the White House to talk about the work that we're doing and, and, you know, sort of a, not just an update, but also an expansion of because of the, the, the pandemic that we're all living through and the stress and the strain 
that it is putting on all Americans and certain um, members of our society, our first responders, our public health workers, our fire, our police, our doctors, nurses, um, you know, there's tremendous stress. All the people who are struggling because now they're unemployed. I mean, so this, this, this mission that we're on with Prevent and our partners like you and others, it was important before. It is so critical now. And the campaign, REACH, we chose that word a year ago, you know, when we started to build this out and we knew we were going to be launching it. We had no idea COVID was coming. We had no idea that the work of our, our um, office was going to be so critical. But we chose this concept um, because it is a bi-directional concept, REACH. The meaning of REACH for us and for all Americans, the message is, we are all within reach. We are. We are all within reach. There is always hope. There is always help. And either I can reach to someone who's hurting, to someone who's struggling, someone I care about, my family, friends, coworkers. It's up to me. It's on me to be part of the solution. Also, if I'm in need, if I'm hurting, we want to encourage people to reach for help. And so we launched this campaign on July 7th. We've received tremendous response from it so far. Um, it, it is really extraordinary. Clearly, this notion of we are all within reach, we all have risk factors, there are things that can protect us, there are ways we can help each other, um, is resonating. And I would encourage all of your listeners to visit our website, which is wearewithinreach.net, there's a pledge you can take that says you are part of the solution and you can join us and follow us and get information and become part of the solution. Um, this is uh, an opportunity. There is a lot of things we cannot control, but if we educate ourselves, we really can learn how to take care of each other and ensure that we're reaching people before they fall through the cracks, before they feel despair. No, thank you for that. And, you know, you use the word educate. And, you know, I want to tie that back to me using the word stigma. And, and I think to all of your points, you know, that's where we are is this is a, a, I'll say a mental health reset, for lack of a better phrase, in terms of how we view it, how we respond to it, how we treat it. And, you know, like the old commercial says, the more you know, the better off we are. Um, and, and this is the time, you know, we're all in lockdown. We've all got lots of time on our hands. I'm not commuting to New York City three hours a day. So I've got three extra hours a day of my life back. Um, you know, that gives me more time to clean the garage or go to Little League or things like that. But, you know, educating, reading, not being afraid, not being, af you know, afraid of the word stigma, um, not being afraid of reaching out to a friend, a colleague, a neighbor, a loved one who you think might be experiencing some difficulty and taking that first step forward. And even, again, if it's you reaching that hand out, saying, hey, you know, are you okay? Do you want to talk? Something as generic as that. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, thank you for the website in terms of wearewithinreach.net. I strongly encourage all of our listeners to go there. Uh, the pledge, I have signed it, um, and, and as well as others, and my firm has in New York. Um, you know, Barbara, what are some of the other uh, social media outlets that folks can, can learn more about the work you're doing? So anyone who wants to read the roadmap itself can go to va.gov slash prevent. You will find us there. That's our website that has the actual roadmap and a lot of resources, a lot of materials. So it's, it's va.gov slash p-r-e-v-e-n-t-s, prevent. And I mentioned the website, uh, wearewithinreach.net. You can go there to take the pledge. You can track us, learn what we're doing. You can become part of the solution. Soon, uh, people, and many people have seen, we've, we've already in the short amount of time that we've launched, since we've launched uh, REACH, we just were looking at the numbers. They're extraordinary. We've had almost 400 million impressions, over a million and a half uh, visits to our website. Thousands of people are taking the pledge. We're going to do a major, major push uh, for September, which is Suicide Prevention mm -hmm. Month. And so we welcome all organizations, all individuals, you know, join us. Soon we're going to have an organizational pledge up on the website. You can contact us if you want to learn more. If you're a, an organization like 
um, Chris has mentioned, you know, his organization is part of the work we're doing in the workplace work, the focus on, on bringing emotional health and well-being to the workforce. There's so much good. Um, and as a child psychologist, one last uh, plug that I'll make, please talk to your kids. Have these conversations with them. Help them see that you, too, struggle sometimes, and here's what you do. Here's what works for you. Give them the language that will serve them for their entire life. If we give them the words, then they will know how to use them to take care of themselves, to take care of each other. Um, lots of great opportunities. I welcome everyone to visit our website and let us know if you want to be more involved. We'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, thank you. You know, and you touched on a great point there with the children, um, even spouses and partners. You know, a few months ago I was doing, which Barbara, you inspired me to do, sort of a, a mental health run uh, three times a week you know, on Facebook Live to get people engaged. And if you just Google things like how to talk to your kids about COVID-19, there are a lot of great articles out there that give you sort of six, nine, 12 bullet points. Um, just very generic. And so it's, I found it very helpful for me personally, uh, for my wife. You know, I've got two teenage daughters and an eight-year-old son. And so sometimes they would want to talk about it, Sometimes they wouldn't. And so at least by putting it out there on the table, um, they know that you're willing to sit there and listen. You know, we as adults are experiencing different things or, or dealing with this differently than, you know, a teenager would be whose entire life is right now is focused on being very social. Um, you know, and all of a sudden they can't do anything for two or three minutes or two or three months. And so, um, you know, trying to help them cope and understand that it's something that we have to do now that we can go out. Yes, you have to wear a mask. I mean, this is how you're being safe. This is how we're keeping numbers down, how you, you know, don't have the spike again, or at least minimize it to a small speed bump instead of a spike. Um, and so it really is, as I guess in most things in life is just about communication, communicate, don't be afraid, you know, talk to each other, um, share what your feelings are, what your experiences are, um, and things like that. And so, uh, Barbara, I appreciate all that insight and that help and commentary. So thank you. Absolutely, Chris, and you've got it. I mean, this is you're 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 a poster child <laughs> for demonstrating that we can all develop these skills, these this ability, this this ability to reach each other and connect around these very critical human conditions and share what works, share our share our struggles and. It's amazing. I think people will find if you reach the vast majority of times, whether you're reaching for help or whether you're reaching to someone who might be in need, you're going to get a positive outcome. People yeah. want to take care of each other and we want to be taken care of. Perfect. As you said, Chris, the most important thing is just, you know, take a breath and reach. Don't be afraid. Right. Put your hand out to someone or put your hand out to be reached by someone. Yeah, thank you. Folks, you've been listening to Next Step Forward. I'm Chris Meek. Had the pleasure of being with Dr. Barbara Van Dalen for the Prevents Task Force today. Again, join us every Tuesday from 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Central. Um, and thanks for joining us here on the Yagro Show. Hope you enjoyed it. Please reach out with questions to myself, Dr. Van Dalen, and look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you all. Take care and God bless.